Good afternoon. Welcome to today's program, Out of the Shadows, Hertford's first Black church and school. My name is Rebecca Tabor Conover, and on behalf of the Connecticut Democracy Center at Connecticut's Old State House, it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's conversation at noon. Please feel free to ask questions throughout the program by posting them in the comment section. We can see your questions and would gladly welcome them and we'll ask them of our speakers. Recently, our neighbors, Hartford's Cap Capital Community College was awarded a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities for a project to raise awareness of the Black community history embodied in the Talcott Street Congregational Church, which stood on a site near the college and near the old state house, and today remains unmarked. There's a connection to the history of Connecticut's old state house with Talcott Street Congregational Church. Some of their members raised money and missionaries who went to Africa with the Amistad captives. That Part of that trial took place here at our building. And also James Mars was a deacon at the Talcott Street Congregational Church. He helped Nancy Jackson, who was petitioning the legislature um, and uh, also worked to petition the legislature to reinstate vote for black men in Connecticut. So we're really excited today to be able to welcome our friends from Capital Community College and help share information about their exciting projects. There really are three main components to Capital Community College's project, a public exhibit, curriculum de development, and a public lecture series. All three components will be discussed in today's program. In order though, to give some historical context to today's program, I would like to first introduce Dr. Barbara Beeching. Dr. Beeching came to Connecticut from Indiana by way of New Orleans, San Antonio, San Antonio and Columbia, Missouri. Once her six children were grown and out of the house, she retired from work and went back to school. In 2010, she finished work on a PhD in American history and later published a book on her dissertation entitled Hopes and Expectations, The Origins of the Black Middle Class in Hartford. Now fully retired, she, Dr. Beeching is still pursuing local historical causes, issues, and other conundrums. Dr. Beeching, thank you and welcome to today's program. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. A little sorry about being remote, but I really um, applaud this very good idea of celebrating Hartford's past, which if we listen to William Faulkner isn't really past, it isn't even over. And in that spirit, I welcome Professor Partridge's invitation to talk here today about the founding institution of Hartford's Black community, the Talcott Street Church. It grew out of a mild act of resistance, and although it no longer stands on the corner of Talcott and Market, it remains an icon in Hartford's Black history. In his recent documentary, Henry Louis Gates Jr. tells us that the black church is the soil in which black culture and political action flowered. True in the long run, <clears throat> although going back to the beginning when Connecticut was a colony, pretty much all the blacks in Hartford were slaves and nobody asked them their cultural, political, or religious preferences, they were taken to church along with their masters. And since all their masters, or almost all, belonged to the first congregational church, that's where most of them were taken. Now, by the 19th century, most of the blacks in Hartford had been born and raised in Connecticut or another of the Northern states. This means they were accustomed to the life and culture around them. They were black Yankees. So that many were literate as well as churched. They had read the Declaration of Independence and they saw the irony in the proposal that all men are created equal. Blacks who were free were hardly equal. They were still subject to exclusion, still confined to metal, menial jobs with no prospect of betterment and with no access to capital, they found it almost impossible to save money, start a business, or even buy a home. In 1818, that irony was driven home by another loss as Connecticut adopted a new state constitution which guaranteed 
the right to vote to all white males. Up to that time, black men had enjoyed that right on the same terms as white men, that is, if they own property or real estate of a certain value. Another provision of the new constitution firmly separated church and state and forbade any preference by law of any religion. In the beginning, when church and state were one, only outliers, either white or black, attended anything but the established church, the Congregational, and it remained the choice of many blacks through the years. In 1818, when that new constitution was adopted, there were 355 blacks in Hartford. Only three of them were slaves. The other 352 were free, in a sense. Accustomed to worshiping at the first congregational church, most of them continued to attend there, but by 1790, they no longer sat with their former masters. Somewhere along the line, they were separated, segregated. As far as I know, there's no description of what that meant in the first congregational, but we can assume it was something like the arrangement in the Baptist church just down the street. According to Jeremiah Asher's memoir, the Baptists had enclosures for black members in either corner of the gallery, like a mezzanine arrangement. Asher described these as about six feet square, with the sides high enough that the worshipers could hardly see the minister or the rest of the congregation and calculated to accommodate about 15 or 20 persons and calculated, we might add, to keep the black members pretty much out of sight. An elevator six feet square would be, is, a tight squeeze for 15 or 20 persons. These enclosures, you might say, embodied the separation of the races. For even after they were freed, blacks were seen by whites as others, people of lesser importance, or what Isabel Wilkerson calls members of a caste. Race prejudice had as firm a grip on the North as on the South, even among white abolitionists who believed slavery to be morally wrong. Few noticed the corollary that if blacks were free, they were also equal and deserved to be treated as equals. Blacks saw this, but didn't act on it in Hartford until 1819, one year after the new state constitution deprived them of the right to vote. Coincidence or not, that was when a, a group of black church members took a stand. Now this story has no footnotes, no real documentation, but every account I've seen of the origins of the black church in Hartford has been stated in the same words, a group of men it reads, tiring of the custom of being assigned seats in the galleries, met with the pastor of the first congregational church to state their objections. That pastor, Joel Hawes, just one year on the job, listened to the protesters, thought about it, and offered them a separate meeting room elsewhere in the church building a kind of two-edged sword. His proposal answered their complaint, but removed them from the nave of the church altogether. We don't know what the protesters expected or how they viewed this solution, but it would hardly have upset the white members. Well, the protesters took the offer, having no choice, and in fact, it gave them a taste of independence and in the long run, put them on a path that helped solidify Hartford's black community. Gathering for worship by themselves, they had choices, not only of seating, but also of preacher, doctrine, rights, style, music, and freedom from white overview. So segregated, but on their own, they now had control of their worship. They did meet in the room offered them but before long, they made another choice and moved out of the white congregational church to a more agreeable, 
an accessible spot in a warehouse on State Street near the river. They formed the African Religious Society, a meeting with no sectarian affiliation. Some of those who had been attending the Baptist and other white churches were no doubt drawn to this new meeting. Powered by their growing numbers, the members of the new African Religious Society decided to build their own meeting house. They picked the corner lot at Talcott and Market Streets for the location and started to raise money to buy the lot and build the church. Members' donations were necessarily small, but fortunately some members of the white elite also contributed to what they evidently saw for what reasons we're not sure as a worthwhile project. City land records confirm that representatives of the black congregation purchased the corner lot of choice. And by 1826, a building of brick and stone stood on the corner of Talcott and Market. Now the black community had the solid center it had lacked. Besides a house of worship, the building had room in the basement for a Sunday school, which soon became a proper weekday classroom for black children. Black parents would have welcomed the opening of this school, particularly those who had taken their children out of white schools because of the way they were treated. One parent cited an incident in which a white girl who misbehaved in class was punished by having to sit with the black scholars. The first teacher in this Talcott Street School was Amos Jerry Beeman, son of the noted Middletown pastor, Jehiel Beeman. Both father and son became nationally recognized activists. Besides Beeman, other prominent figures who taught in the Talcott Street, Talcott Street School through the 1830s included the daguerreotypist Augustus Washington and the famously obscure author Anne Plato. The curriculum was the same as that of the white schools of the time and the city's inspector of schools visited regularly. He occasionally noted the need for more books, but generally found the teaching and the performance of pupils average or better. In 1833, members of the Talcott Street Church made another major decision when a majority voted to identify formally as a congregational church. Pastors from white assemblies, including the first congregational, took part in the formal ceremonies confirming that affiliation. Not all of the members applauded this connection, and they did what Protestants do they split off. They formed a separate church. It was the African Methodist Episcopal Zion. Its founding minister was Jose Easton, a man of strong opinions and a powerful speaker. Although he was pastor of the Talcott Street Church at the time of the split, he obviously agreed with the dissenters who opposed the move to congregationalism. Easton was raised in Massachusetts where his father, James, owned an iron foundry, which also provided a school for his workers. The business appeared to be prospering, but after some 15 years, it and the school had failed. Many, including Jose, believed this was because of white resentment. Spurred by his father's loss, Easton trained for the ministry and became a forceful advocate of both the abolition of slavery and equality for free people. The importance of the progression by Hartford Blacks from segregated seating in jail-like cubicles to founding and maintaining two independent churches can hardly be overstated. For, as Henry Louis Gates Jr. points out, the church was the center of the black community. Its functions were religious, certainly, but also social, political, and beneficent. Both of these churches, separately and together, 
fostered societies promoting temperance and literacy, both invited national leaders to visit Hartford and speak, both held fairs and other fundraisers for worthy causes. However, for both congregations, funding remained a persistent problem. Their ministers were often forced to find day jobs to supplement what their congregations could offer them. Through the 1830s, this problem is evident in the short stays of a string of pastors serving the Talcott Street Church. But in 1840, a young minister who was already beginning to make a name for himself saw potential in Hartford and took over the pastorate of the Talcott Street Church. The Reverend J.W.C. Pennington was a fugitive slave, although at that time he had not yet acknowledged it publicly. His first priority on escaping north had been to gain an education, and in this he did succeed. He even managed to attend classes at Yale, although he sat in the hall to hear the lectures because it was unthinkable for a black man to join the white students in the classroom. Persisting in his quest, Pennington finally met the requirements and was consecrated as a minister of the Congregational Faith. After a brief assignment in New York, he came to Hartford, where he soon doubled the membership of the Talcott Street Church, earning for himself and his flock a reputation for activism. If we look back at the 19th century, before the secular age we inhabit now, religion was a given, understood as part of everyday life. In black communities, many of the religious revivals and reform movements of the time generated those societies devoted to uplifting the race. Overall, of course, the persistent national issue in the antebellum period was the future of slavery. Abolitionists in the North launched newspapers, published bulletins, posted broadsides, and drummed continually on the evils of human bondage. As a result, the tension between the increasingly industrial North and the mostly rural South grew stronger during the 1830s and 40s. Both the Talcott Street Church and the AME Zion entertained nationally known abolitionists, Frederick Douglass, Henry Highland Garnett, and William Lloyd Garrison among them. As the temperature on both sides over slavery rose, a series of incidents across the country and the state kept the issue alive. Riots related to race questions plagued the major cities of the North and Hartford was not spared. In 1835, the Talcott Street Church held a series of meeting, meetings urging abolition. And on each night, those who attended were attacked by whites as they left the church. After three nights of increasingly angry confrontations, the county sheriff deputized a number of citizens and called out the governor's foot guard a move that ended the riots in Hart Hartford, but failed to end the dispute over slavery, which ended, as you know, in the Civil War, which did finally end slavery. But that was not the end of what Jose Easton called the scourge of prejudice. The Talcott Street Church continued through the years to stand for the rights of blacks as citizens free and equal persons. Outstanding pastors include the Reverend Robert F. Wheeler and the Reverend James A. Wright. In 1906, the original church was torn down and replaced with a new two-story structure to accommodate a growing membership. Then in 1953, the Talcott Street Church merged with the Mother Bethel Methodist and a year later moved to its present location, 2030 Main Street, as Faith Congregational Church. In 2019, 
Faith Congregational celebrated the 200th anniversary of the founding of the Talcott Street Church with an outdoor ceremony on Talcott Street between Main and Market, a grand and moving tribute to a historic religious institution with roots in Connecticut's past, a black church that continues to fulfill the role as a vital center of black life and culture. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Beeching, for being with us today and for sharing that information. I'd like to next introduce Dr. Jeffrey Partridge. Dr. Partridge is uh, the project director of the Talcott Street Church Project. We've had the pleasure of working with him for many years now um, through his work as um, the director of the uh, Hartford Heritage Project in which Connecticut's old state house takes place, takes part rather. Um, Dr. Partridge is professor of English and chair of the humanities department at Capital Community College. He is, as I mentioned, director of the Hartford Heritage Project, a place-based education initiative that incorporates Hartford into the learning experience at Capital. And he's the faculty director for the Liberal Arts Action Lab. Dr. Partridge has authored three National Endowment for the Humanities grants that have received funding, including Capital's Black Heritage Project based on the history of the Talcott Street Congregational Church. Dr. Partridge, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Rebecca. And uh, thank you, uh, Barbara, for that uh, wonderful introduction to the history of the church. It just reminds me of, of why we're doing this, uh, the, the inspiring story of this church and the people of this church um, uh, is something that we really want uh, students at Capital Community College and staff and faculty to embrace and be excited about. And I'm, I'm gonna share um, a brief PowerPoint with you, and then I'm going to be introducing uh, each panelist who's going to talk about a specific aspect of this project that we're launching in the fall. So we're, we're, we're looking forward to launching this uh, coming up in the fall, and, um, and we are introducing this to you today because we'd like the public to know what, what, what we're doing, and we want to draw more and more connections with the community around us. We already have wonderful connections with uh, Faith Congregational Church, um, the Hartford History Center, and the Old State House, and, and others that I'll mention along the way. Um, so I'm going to share my screen now and get my PowerPoint up here. There we go. And I'd like to enlarge that. There we go. Oops. Oops. I just did something wrong. All right. All right, pardon me, everyone. Um, I hope everyone can see my, my screen now. Um, okay, so the proposed exhibit, uh, I'm sorry, this is the wrong. No, this is, okay. Um, what I'm showing you right here is the current site of the uh, of, of where there's a, a parking structure on the corner of Talcott and Market Streets. Um, what you're seeing there is Mel Chin's 1991 installation. So this was taken in 1991, uh, which shows the uh, the these this kind of apparition of the Talcott Street Congregational Church. Um, this is located at the rear entrance to Capital Community College. Uh, we have uh, the parking structure behind this on Market Street, um, and then we walk through the building. And every day um, we see, um, as you can see here, this is the entrance. Um, we have uh, 
many students passing through. I, I, I'm showing the wrong, uh, I'm sorry. I don't know how that happened. I was showing the wrong slideshow. Okay, <laughs> I apologize. Um, So what, what I was going to show you, those pictures, what they show you is the, um, the, the proximity of, of Talcott Street Congregational Church, the, where it used to be located, right next to our college. Thousands of people from Capital Community College, students, staff, and faculty walk by this every day. And we were um, looking for some way to bring this out of the shadows. To, to make this something that's a part of the lived experience of Capital Community College. Um, so a year ago uh, in, in uh, the Liberal Arts Action Lab, which is our uh, Capital Community College has a, a partnership with Trinity College. And the Liberal Arts Action Lab, we, we uh, uh, ran a project and I was the project team leader. And I had four students, three from Capital Community College, Aaliyah Freeman Johnson, uh, Armani Parther, uh, Julian Hogan, and then a student from Trinity, Mercy Uno, who created a uh, an exhibit, an online exhibit uh, that that uh, introduces this this um, this history, and that we now have featured on the Hartford Heritage website at Capital Community College. Um, this project that the students created also introduced a, a few recommendations that uh, could help Capital Community College to bring this history out of the shadows and make it part of our lived experience. And so um, the National Endowment for the Humanities uh, was, uh, we, we applied for a grant and, and uh, we received the grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities. And that is, um, currently what we, what we're starting in this project and so what we're introducing to you today are these ideas that were created through the uh, liberal arts action lab um, in in conjunction with the hartford history center at the hartford public library and the hartford heritage project at capital community college um, we have three components to this project and i'm going to uh, introduce each uh, of our members of the panel to talk about each component. So the first one, first uh, person I'd like to introduce is, is Dr. Frank Mitchell. Uh, Frank Mitchell is a curator, educator, and public humanities practitioner. He is a curatorial advisor for the Tony N. and Wendell C. Harp Historical Museum at the Dixwell Q House. Uh, he received his AB in history and English from Bowdoin College his MA in African American Studies from Yale University, and his PhD in programs in American culture from the University of Michigan. Um, so please welcome uh, Frank Mitchell. Frank, if you could hold on a second, could you unmute yourself, please? Um, okay. There you go. Thank you. I clicked on it. Shoot. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Jeff, I appreciate all the work you've done to bring this project to this point. Uh, it's been a Herculean effort. And I remember back in July when we're emailing back and forth in the midst of a pandemic to imagine the possibility. So congratulations to getting us this far. Uh, ultimate faith in you. It's an exciting time, uh, really momentous time to be doing this kind of work. Uh, the anniversaries of Talcott Street and Faith uh, and also the Dixwell Congregational Church in New Haven remind us of this incredible history that we have this opportunity to interpret and share. Uh, and we all benefit from the past 25 years of investment in recovering the stories of 
uh, Fortune and Bristow and Lanson and uh, James Mars and Venture Smith and Ann Plato and all these folks who live around us uh, in Connecticut in this history and who we don't talk enough about or see enough about or recognize as the context of our lives. And I guess at this point, Mariana, if you can throw up that first slide, it'd be great. And as we continue uncovering this history that goes back to the 1600s here in Connecticut, uh, we're reminded of the moment when uh, the African Burial Ground Project, the visitor center there was opened and the New York Times critic Everett Rothstein showed up and wrote, uh, had this question uh, at the ceremony. Among the scars left by the heritage of slavery, one of the greatest is an absence. Where are the memorials, cemeteries, architectural structures or sturdy sanctuaries that typically provide the ground for a people's memory? And it's, it's a really incredible question. And this image behind uh, the text is an image from uh, that site in Lower Manhattan where they did find hundreds of bodies of black workers uh, and noticed on a map from the 1750s that it was uh, the Negro burial ground for Lower Manhattan. And many of those remains were taken off to labs at Howard University where they were examined. And there's now this incredible monument there uh, which brought together Rodney Leon, the architect, Houston Conwell, community leaders, uh, thinkers, activists, artists, to continue to reinterpret it or interpret it. And I think it's sort of a beacon in this kind of work. Uh, maybe the next slide now, Mariana, if we could. Uh, and in in that effort, we definitely have to acknowledge uh, that we're in this incredible moment uh, where, thanks to the pandemic, uh, the murders of George Floyd and a lot of other folks whose names we can't say enough, uh, there is this space that's opened up for us to really think about uh, just what Rothstein mentions, that there is this incredible history that and an absence of mourning and an absence of spaces for mourning, for acknowledging kind of the strength that it took to survive and for having that as part of daily life. Uh, and so we were watching, even in this period, uh, the emergence of creative projects, uh, museums, monuments, memorials to just that suffering and just that history. Uh, and I'll just point a couple of them out for context. Uh, the uh, incredible work that the Equal Justice Initiative is doing in Alabama to tell the stories around lynching and sort of the entire history of, of terrorism inflicted on people of color over the centuries. Uh, and some wonderful work by artists. And here you see uh, the work of Hank Willis Thomas and Kwame Obanfo uh, out of Ghana to help tell that story and remind us to balance the morning with the history, which is a constant challenge. And maybe to the next slide, Mariana, if we could. And with these sort of big public monuments that are happening in nonprofit arts and humanity spaces, there is this effort to document and tell these stories and atone, acknowledge, provide a space for uh, remembering and activism on college campuses. And I guess the one that we'll just note here is the recently completed memorial to enslaved laborers on the UVA campus. Uh, and the incredible work that that coalition of folks did to bring that piece uh, to life. Uh, and it really was a coalition in many ways similar to the coalition that Jeff and other folks have pulled together for this project of community leaders, uh, folks to help with interpretation, artists, architects, historians, uh, students who were on the campus, administrators to help provide a space for the kind of mourning and remembrance and leadership that these stories require. Uh, and, and that because of so many things that have happened over the past five and 10 years, 
uh, we suddenly have the space to begin to process and acknowledge. And that, that will certainly continue. So I'm excited that this project uh, is happening at a moment when there are there is a precedent for the kind of reconciliation, for doing work that is historical, but also has room for uh, 21st century technology, because we don't have a lot of artifacts that speak to that particular moment, but is also a chance for mourning and memorializing and uh, remembering. Uh, just as Barbara noted, you know, there were uh, cataclysmic moments in the life of that, the early life of the church where people faced terrorism. Uh, there were all kinds of souls who lived and died that we don't know of uh, in that area. So this is a chance to collect a lot of different history that's local in some cases, but it's also statewide and to begin to create this new precedent for uh, teaching and mourning and celebrating uh, at a time when we really, do, really, really, really do need that, uh, given all that's happening in this world. Um, I think I'm going to stop there uh, and hope to talk more about this in the question. part. Great. Thank you, Frank. And so Frank is, uh, is going to be curating an exhibit that will be featured um, and, and, and will be longstanding uh, that will, will um, be open to the public. So that's something that we hope a, about a year from now we'll be able to, uh, to unveil that exhibit. Um, the second, so that's the first prong of our approach in this, this project. The second one is a curriculum writing program that we are doing together uh, both at our college and also we've invited Capital Prep uh, to take part in this as well so that they will be creating curriculum as well. And to talk about that today, we have um, Professor Antoinette Brimbell, uh, who is, is my colleague in the English department at Capital Community College, where she also serves as the teaching and learning consultant and chair for the Center for Teaching. Um, uh, and Antoinette is a wonderful poet. Uh, uh, if you haven't checked out her work, uh, she's the author of three full-length poetry collections. Um, these Women You Gave Me, that's what, uh, the most recent, uh, Icarus in Love, and Psalm of the Sunflower. Um, Antoinette is a Cave Canem Foundation Fellow. Uh, so I'm going to pass it over now to Antoinette. Hello, thank you very much. It is through educational opportunities, community partnerships, and ongoing constructive conversations that equity, inclusion, understanding and belonging can be cultivated and inculturated in our colleges, communities, and state. Subsequently, Capital Community College, Capital Preparatory Magnet School, and its partners endeavor to create curriculum that affords access to cultural, educational, and resource centers that offer opportunities for student engagement with and within the greater Hartford area. Understanding that Hartford is a city of complexity where diverse communities share space with hidden histories, the Black Heritage Project curriculum writing team has committed itself to research the rich contributions of Blacks and Native Americans to Connecticut history, literature, culture, and to our state's aspiration of equality for its citizens. 17 educators from Capital Community College and Capital Preparatory Magnet School will produce scholarship and curriculum that will not only educate our students, but will connect them to the history that colors our present day. These diverse scholars from various academic disciplines will evidence that history is multifaceted in its perspective and scope, and that the responsibility of its curation and keeping belongs to everyone. The Capital Community College curriculum will include sections of courses in history, literature, composition, college success, first year experience, and a liberal arts capstone course for its majors. 
Capital Prep will create a historical module with a sociology course on minorities in the U.S., as well as lessons in English and history. Areas of study will also include immigration, race and racialisms, memorializing monuments in public spaces, philosophical underpinnings of the human sense of place, and the explication and studies of Pastor Pennington's speeches. Our research will explore Connecticut poets amidst the canon and the continued contribution of Connecticut poets to contemporary poetic movements and their complement and conflict with public memory and historical record. Additionally, scholars will explore the situation of marginalized perspectives and voice within literature and place, and the role of the Black church in issues of equality and justice. Within this curriculum, students will find representations of themselves, their neighbors, and their neighborhoods, and they will celebrate the many diverse groups whose legacy of toil and struggle and resilience helped to build our state. And as our students matriculate, their unique understanding of the importance of interconnectedness will lead them to active participation and service in their communities. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Brim Bell. Um, so that, that's the second component of this project, the curriculum writing. We have the exhibition and the curriculum writing. And the third component and final component is the uh, Pennington Lecture, which we will be introducing next February. And I'm uh, very happy to introduce today um, our leader of Capital Community College, our CEO, Dr. G. Duncan Harris. Uh, Dr. Harris serves as the Chief Executive Officer of Capital Community College. Uh, where he is responsible for strategic direction and daily operations of the college. In 2014, he also launched the CSCU Student Success Center. He holds a doctorate of education from Nova Southeastern University, a master of science degree in counseling from CCSU, a bachelor of science degree in economics from UConn, and a certificate in management and leadership from Harvard University. Uh, Dr. Harris, we are so thankful that you are here today and look forward to what you have to say about this third aspect of our project. Well, thanks, uh, Jeff. Uh, glad to be here uh, today. Um, and, uh, you know, I wanted to thank Barbara first on her um, her talk about the significance of, of history and the, the church. Uh, one of the comments that uh, she referenced was the idea of some of the challenges faced by uh, Black people uh, some 200 years ago uh, with regard to access to capital, ability to buy a home and to vote. And so fast forward uh, over 200 years later, <clears throat> and we see that we're still confronted with challenges uh, similar to our ancestors over two centuries ago. And so, so it's an honor to be at the helm of this college at this point in our nation's uh, history uh, and on the, the heels of the historic uh, verdict that was rendered this week and, and then all the other other challenges that 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 we that we faced and continue to face, um, um, you know. Once again, this 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 project um, uh, comes on the heels of uh, and the, the affirmation. I was going through some emails that Jeff and I were were exchanging last year about going after this grant, which is an extremely highly competitive grant. Um, when you look at the other uh, higher education institutions that have received this funding, uh, you know we're delighted to be amongst that that company. Uh, but uh, May 25th, uh, you know, close to over a year ago, we, we were uh, confronted by the murder of George Floyd. And uh, my father's name is, is George. Uh, my grandfather's name is George. And my nephew's name is George. And so I was uh, traumatized and, and like so many of, uh, Americans of, of all hues, uh, you know, at that point in time. Like many, I sent out a, a, an email message, a statement. Uh, to my campus about uh, the impact of, of that uh, event on, on our institution and, and the community within which the college exists. And one of my faculty members um, responded, is this it, uh, to that, that uh, statement that I made. 
And at that point, um, as an institution, uh, we agreed that that statements weren't enough, uh, that concrete, actionable steps were required. And at that time, we launched into you know our our plan of plan of action. And so I'll share a few of the the events uh, that that took place you know at that point in time. Uh, on June tenth, uh, we had a, a forum. Uh, we had over 130 um, uh, members of our college community attend that. Um, uh, Dr. Jeff Ogbar from from uh, UConn provided some historical context of the events and the role of police and um, violence against Black peoples in, in America. And we we uh, it was a healing session. Folks didn't know what we wanted to do, but we knew that we were going to do something, and we came together at that point. Uh, after that, we began to map out. Uh, once again, institutional commitments to addressing systemic racism and social injustice in, in our community. Uh, uh, Capital is one of the most diverse um, community colleges in New England, and we are actually 36% black uh, in terms of our, our student uh, population. And so there's a list of, of activities that, that have uh, taken place over the course of the last year on the screen. Um, there, uh, we've had uh, uh, panels and speakers. You know, we were active uh, members of faculty, staff, and students in all of the social justice events that occurred over the last year. We had an amazing James Baldwin series that was another cross-disciplinary curriculum uh, uh, activity this fall. Uh, we have uh, launched a, a mentoring program that focuses in on, on Black and Latinx students. Uh, there's a, a picture in the upper right hand corner about our commitment to increasing the diversity of our, our state's teacher population and we're embarking on that work um, and uh, we have a uh, an equity diversity and inclusion center uh, that we launched and with support from the Hartford Foundation that has done amazing work and then we're currently in the mix of a 90-day read and we have probably about a, uh, 40 members of, of our faculty and staff engaged in a common read and, and courageous conversations uh, around the, the racial healing handbook by Annalise Singh. And so that's a very powerful um, exercise that we're going that will inform our anti-racism uh, stance and, and institutional value and commitment uh, uh, this fall. Um, like many, our, our institution um, went forth and, and endorsed a statement on anti-racism. Uh, that was endorsed by a college administration, our college senate, our student government uh, association, and I'm not going to read that to you, but it's very similar to the anti-racism statements that have been put forth by um, many of the, the towns in, in the state. So once again, um, statements weren't enough. Uh, we've moved to steps. And that, in light of that is, is this initiative that we're uh, in terms of the black church. Um, the one of the components to that, and as Jeff alluded to, and I want to make sure we have some time for, for Q&A, but is the third prong is the, the Pennington Lecture Series. And so the Pennington Lecture Series will, will um, be bringing in internationally regarded speakers, fitting of the spirit uh, of Reverend Pennington. And so um, and I'll and I'll make an announcement in a second about our first two. Um, but but this is while it will be housed at at Capitol, there's an expectation that that this is a speaker series for our community. And so we'll be reaching out to, to individuals, uh, stakeholders, fellow stakeholders to help promote and actually facilitate the event. Right. So we're we're looking for this to be uh, while well housed here, but it to, to truly be reflective of the Hartford community. And so we'll be putting together uh, a group of uh, of fellow stakeholders to 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 work with us arm in arm on on this significant event for our, our community, and we'll also be reaching out to some of the corporate entities in this space to to um, to invest in the series. Um, uh, many of you who have um, worked on the planning of of events of this type know how important it is to to lock in speakers early, and I'm pleased this year that we've uh, locked in our first two speakers of international regard. Uh, Dr. Sarah, Sarah Lewis, many of you may be uh, familiar with her work and her uh, book, The Rise. Uh, she's a, an associate professor at Harvard. And uh, we've also locked in our, uh, our keynoter for two, uh, 2022, uh, uh, Dr. Jelani Cobb. And uh, many of us are, are certainly familiar with the work of Dr. Dr. Cobb at this point in time. And so 
you know, once again, uh, um, I'm so delighted that, you know, Capital has uh, moved beyond statements. I think that this project is reflective of, of our middle name in terms of community and that we are Hartford's community, Vanguard Community College, and how we allocate our resources and time, talent, and treasure in support of, of uh, the, our community and, and the richness of the history uh, of all people, and, and which certainly um, would include the rich history of, of the, the, the black people of, of Hartford and, and that history. And so, um, so prong three is, is, is once again, the lecture series. Uh, next steps will be that we'll be reaching out to individuals uh, to, to uh, lock arms with us in support of this program. Great. Thank you, Dr. Harris. Um, just just uh, in case anyone was writing down those dates for the lectures, please wait for the announcements about them because we actually have, um, we have moved those to February. So the first one will be next February, so 2022, and the, the second one will be in uh, the following February, 2023. Uh, but we will be advertising those and getting the word out to the community. Um, so uh, that's the three, that's, that's the, Hart, the Hartford, I'm sorry, the Black uh, Heritage Project at Capital Community College. And, um, and so we have time uh, for some questions. Uh, if, if there's anything in, the, uh, in the, the comments section that people want to ask a question, um, I think uh, Rebecca is also going to be involved in this. Hi. Um, so far, I don't see any questions really that have come up, but uh, one interesting comment about how the par uh, parallels rather between Talcott Street Church in Hartford and Temple Street Church in New Haven, both founded at the same historical moment um, for similar reasons are remarkable. One question that we had for our friends who are involved with uh, Capital Community College is, um, what do you think, how do you think this project is going to impact capital and your students? Well, let me, let me jump in. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not sure that our students recognize the hollowed ground where they pursue their education, right? And, and each and every day they, they walk past this site that has, um, you know, uh, been a, 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 a hollowed ground for black scholarship for over two centuries. And I think that that will be very empowering to our students to, to know that history and, and hopefully um, provide them with uh, motivation and, and additional determination to pursue uh, their scholarly uh, endeavors here. And so, so they're studying on hollowed ground. Uh, and I think that there's a lot of, lot of power in that and that um, the power of the site. So we're very excited yeah. about promoting that. I, I'd like to uh, add something to that as well. Um, I, I see our, our friend um, uh, Bill Hosley is on, on the, uh, the, in the audience today. And uh, Bill, of course, works very closely with us at, in the Hartford Heritage Project in creating the, uh, running the Hartford History Lecture Series that we run. And uh, something that Bill likes to say is that you can't, love a place you don't know. Mm -hmm. And um, and so our place-based initiative at, at Capital, and especially as we look at this project, the Black Heritage Project, um, we want to inspire uh, our students uh, to, to embrace Hartford and to feel that they want to get involved, that they want to be uh, civically engaged. And I know this is the, the mission of the old state house. So we, we have these, these, uh, these organizations around us that have the same goals. And we'd really like to see this project kind of galvanize those efforts. Um, and with the long view of, of people who live here, uh, taking a stake in, in the future of Hartford. Well, we have a comment from um, Cleo Graham, who's watching, um, who is asking, would you consider giving a presentation after our worship service? I believe she's a pastor at Faith uh, Congregational. Um, 
it, it, so it seems like you've already built community partnerships um, through this project. And I know at the old state house, we always enjoy working with all of your team. Um, we did have a question from the audience um, from Bessie Rena, who asked, is anyone doing research on Nancy Jackson after she obtained freedom? I don't know. <laughs> I would also add that we're in the very beginning stages. Um, mm -hmm. I just went to the college and uh, with a little wheelbarrow like thing and brought home a ton of books. Um, this is the beginning of us digging into the history. And although we have topics that we've already uh, kind of laid claim to, we imagine that we are gonna find so many other um, amazing opportunities for research mm -hmm. and uh, lecture and conferences and that type of thing. So if you have anything that you um, think that we need to be aware of, shoot us an email. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I would just add, there's a lot of parallel work going on around the state. So as far north as Cornwall, uh, here in New Haven, certainly what's gonna be happening there in Hartford means that we're likely to uncover more about some of these 19th century characters that we only know a little bit about now. I think that's been the trajectory over the past 25 years. So she's not on the list, but that doesn't mean we won't find out more about her in the process of doing this work. Well, I, I hope so, because I know that um, Sally Whipple just was mentioning that um, David White had done work on Nancy Jackson and, and James Marr's involvement with her whole story of um, suing for her freedom. Um, and, but it's really only up until the court case. So hopefully that'll be one of the stories that um, is uncovered. And actually one of the things that has been going through my mind throughout today's program is I can't wait to talk to all of you in a year to uh -huh. find out what you've discovered and yeah. to hear plans for the, um, to hear plans for the exhibit to, to attend the first lecture. So it, it, I'm very excited um, about the work you're doing and look forward to what you'll be uncovering. Um, Rebecca, I see that uh, that our friend Don Rogers is asking about suburban audiences and what they will gain from this. And um, I guess I have a couple of answers for that. For one thing, um, a capital community college serves the sub suburban areas as well uh, outside of Hartford. So we have plenty of students who are going to be uh, learning uh, through this project, uh, this history. But also, um, you know, we're very we're hopeful that that um, there are a lot of of organizations and, and in in our community who have a stake in the future of 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 uh, this of the, of memorializing this site and making it a part of our understanding in Hartford and with and, and in surrounding towns. So we are hopeful that that uh, we can join with others to uh, to be able to commemorate the actual site where that church uh, stood. Um, and, and, and that that will be something on the Freedom Trail, that will be something on maybe a Hartford Black History Trail. Uh, it'll be something that people from all around, even outside the state, when they come to Hartford, will be able to visit. That's uh, something we hope this will inspire or help, help to galvanize. Well, I, I want to just thank all of our speakers today for being part of this wonderful program and sharing um, about this great project. And perhaps in closing, I can ask each one of you to just say briefly, what excites you most about this program? Or excuse me, rather about, about this project that you're working on. I'll jump in, I don't, in the interest of time. I, I think that uh, the, the, the timing couldn't be better with all that's going on in, in our country. And I think for Capital to assume this role as a convener around the topic of anti-racism, anti-poverty, and social justice uh, is is fitting for Hartford's community college. And so, uh, so I'm truly excited about that and the role that we'll play in, in, in building a coalition on this topic. Jeff? Sure, uh, I'll go next. I'm 
Uh, so much, so much about this excites me. I'm really looking forward to getting this material and these, this, these, uh, these, the course designs and the sort of things that we're going to do with curriculum, getting that in front of students and just, just seeing their reactions to to this because. I can't tell you, I mean, there are books you can read and, and if you need a list, you can write to me. Um, they're, they're in, and a great place to start is Barbara Beeching's book, Hope and Expectations. You read about these people and it's inspiring. And I think our students are just mm -hmm. gonna be really, really empowered by, by what they learn. And I guess I'll jump in and say it's a, it's a really great chance to begin the discussion around a national monument for this history here in Connecticut. Great, thank you. I am just so excited. I feel like a kid in a candy store. Um, I want to learn everything that I can and to share it with the students. And I think the students will see themselves differently when they see that uh, people who looked like them um, were a part of you know, building our state and that they have um, a history too, uh, and that history is inclusive. And I think what work we'll do will be far reaching and I hope it will be a model for um, other cities and other states um, to make sure that this history is uh, curated and that it's kept for everyone going forward. Great, thank you. And Barbara? Yeah, I was I was going to say, I think that the idea that you're reaching so many young people is really <laughs> the best part of this because they're, they're not um, full adults necessarily yet, and they are beginning to see what it's like to be an adult and what's, what their opportunities and obligations are as citizens. And the, I just hope that uh, as has been mentioned with all the things that are going on around the subject of race, that, that this is um, like an antidote to the difficulties this program is. Well, I can think of no better way to conclude such a great program today. Thank you all for joining us. Mm -hmm. And I would invite all of our audience to um, make sure to fill out the uh, survey that is in the comments. I'm looking forward, Dr. Beeching, to delve into your book. That's it's sitting in my office, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. And I would uh, invite you to join us for our upcoming programs in May. So tonight, if you have uh, an opportunity, there's an encounters program on City Beautiful from 6 to 8 p.m. And then coming up next month in May, we will be celebrating Historic Preservation Month. And on Tuesday, May the 18th, we will be um, talking a little bit about historic preservation and diversity. And we hope you can join us for that. It's another conversation at noon. Thank you all for being with us. And we will look forward to seeing you at our next program. And we look forward to having all of you back maybe in a year or so to hear an update on this fabulous project. Thank you for your work on behalf of Hartford. Thank you, Rebecca. Thanks everyone. Take care.